Welcome to the Know Your Ship Podcast, presented by eHub. I'm your host, Frank Dolce. That's the poacher. <laughs> that's, that's the poacher, the deer poacher. Well, I mean, the crazy thing about it is that it's just, it like your whole business model is, and it would have been just, I mean, you could still mm-hmm. run the yeah, business. I'd have but, laughed and made them run it, done yeah. something else. I'm honored to be on the set with the Van Workham duo, <laughs> the, the brothers. By the way, I said Van Workham. This is Eric. This mm-hmm. is Aaron. I said Van Workham. That's a very anglicized way to say your last name. Do, do you know the original, how you say it originally? <clears throat> I lived in Sweden for two years, and uh, there was a Dutch guy in one of my wards. And he said it was Van Furkum. Oh, you should do. The, I, you, I speak Swedish. I don't speak Dutch, so I don't. I don't know how to tell you exactly, but that's what I've been told. It means from, right? Van means from, so from Verkum, Workum. Oh, yeah. There's actually a nice. city in the Netherlands named Van Workum. Really? Yeah. So Van Workum is from Van Workum. Yep. You know the way that you just said it. It sounds like you like that's a vampire hunter. Name. I mean, maybe that could be one of your things. Is you, you know, there's TV shows about that now. <laughs> Vampire hunters. That's a big deal. Say that again. How do you say your last Fanfurkum. name? Yes. <laughs> That's it perfect. sounds like a swear word. In fact, in sweet in Swedish, fun is, is the bad? F word. Is it really? In, what? in Swedish, it is. Yep. Teach, in, in can Swedish. you teach me how to say fun. that afterwards? Yeah. I think if you say swear words in languages other than English, then we don't have to edit it. No, they say our swear words all the time. All the time. All the time. And it's just like saying hello. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it was no really offensive deal. to me as a missionary. Is that where you served your mission? Yeah, that's where I served my mission. Oh. By the way, I didn't do the proper introduction. We got into your last name. But Eric, Aaron, these guys are the founders of a great company that we get to work with called Muley Freak. Uh, so why don't you just take five minutes or whatever you want. Give us the 30,000 foot, foot view of... Muley Freak. Yeah, 30,000 foot view, Muley Freak. We are a YouTube channel slash brand um, who also makes some specialized custom products. Um, a YouTube channel, we showcase our hunts, our lifestyle, our adventures in the mountains, uh, both bow hunting and rifle hunting. And with that, we have kind of a popular brand we've created behind it called Muley Freak that we do branded stuff, t-shirts, hats, hoodies, um, and more recently, some performance apparel, uh, puffy jackets, merino wool. And then kind of our flagship product is our game changer bino harness it's a custom piece that aaron and i worked on for two years that accommodates the bow hunter and the rifle hunter alike mm. and it's one-handed operational no magnets involved sits on your chest nice high and tight doesn't move whisper quiet for the bow hunter and uh we've honestly kind of i don't know just uh crushed it with that thing so awesome uh and i did check that out on your website now you are what is your title with the company uh ceo so you're Aaron's boss. I'm Aaron's boss. Ha! Are you also the older brother? I'm the older brother. Okay. Well, so that kind of works out. And Aaron, you're director of marketing. Is that fair yeah, or is that... that works. Okay. Director of everything, everything else. Yeah. You know, I, I really relate to that. I feel like I'm a jack of all trades with eHub. Hence, in addition to my other duties, I host the podcast. <laughs> so I'm a jack of all trades. That's where you find yourself as well. What do your daily activities look like? Um, literally a little bit of everything. And Eric just, you know, Eric does a little bit of everything too. Mm-hmm. And we each, you know, maybe are a little more heavy in, in certain aspects, but we're, we both have our hand in everything. So gotcha. Heavy in sales though over here. So does Aaron though. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, we do a little bit of everything. Sales, marketing, marketing, design, sales, sales, design, design. Getting, Yeah. Content, over, content. Over, overseeing new stuff that's being designed and built and yeah. getting it here and selling it and from A to Z. Well, I heard that maybe both of you, but I heard that you have a little bit of background in sales. You cut your teeth in maybe the most challenging sales arena available yeah. in the door-to-door industry. Yeah. Kind of a funny story. I got off my mission from Sweden and... uh you know, as every young kid wants to be a billionaire, right? And so, uh, and they want to get to it fast. They don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. I got some uh, elevator pitch of, hey, if you sell 20 alarm systems door to door this month, you get a flat screen TV. And that was when there (laughs) was a big one. Yeah. That's when there wasn't, it was a 42 incher. Oh my gosh. (laughs) So not not really big. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, okay, I can sling 20 alarm systems, you know? 
And I was working a satellite job, selling satellites over the phone. And like door to door, man, that's brutal. I just got done doing door to door for two years. And it was, yeah, it was, it was brutal. When, when you say, let me just clarify, when you say door to door, you're talking about your mission. Yes. Selling Jesus door to door. Yes. Yeah. Which is va- very valuable. Very valuable. Absolutely. I wouldn't change it for anything. I loved but, it. But challenging. I'm a Jesus lover. I believe in Jesus through and through. He's my savior. Amen. But, but uh, yeah, trying to sell, I'm like, man, if I can sell Jesus, I can sell an alarm system, home protection. <laughs> 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 yeah. I just had this vision of a of a new door to door home security system, you know, based on the life of our Savior. I think we might have something there. Yeah. If, if you want to do yeah. something else, let's talk after. <laughs> yeah, Christ alarm. Just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, so I just started that, and then I made. Then I it was almost like I was so excited about the TV, I didn't realize that I'd made eight thousand dollars that month as a twenty one year old back in two thousand seven, which is a big deal, right? Yeah, absolutely. So then I just started doing it more and more and realized that you could travel. I traveled a few years, did uh, Virginia Beach, Wisconsin, did Seattle a couple of sh- summers. And so I kind of was a little bit selfish and just did it for myself. But, uh, you know, I, I, I also was of the mindset like, hey, most of these guys come or do this for three, four months. Then they come home and just sit around, don't right. do anything, mm-hmm. spend their money, whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I want to be making money still. So then I developed the model uh, to do it year round. And I started doing it here locally. So I always had money coming in and I was saving it, saving it, saving it. So, um, yeah, I, I was, I, I just wasn't satisfied with the three, four month income type thing. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Did you have a similar experience selling door to door? And yeah, I didn't do it as long as Eric, but I came home and I went straight to pest control. So I did that for a season and a half, a year and a half. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Okay. We have solar, we have pest control, and we have alarm systems, mm-hmm. door to door. How how would you rank those in terms of which has the highest status and which has the lowest status? I, I would say solar is the highest, that, alarms next, pest control last. Yeah, Not to say you can't say make too. tons of money in pest control because you absolutely can. It's just probably the easier sell. Mm. You can do more volume, right? Gotcha. Like if you're selling three three to five alarms a day, you're crushing it. Mm-hmm. A, a good pest control, you could do 12 accounts in a day. 12 to 20 accounts. How yeah. many hours? All day long. Yeah, all day, knocking knocking doors all day. I mean, Chandler, Chandler, I know he... Chandler Bergen is Bergen. who we're talking about, yep. who, who works with eHub as the director of sales. Yeah, and for a long time, you know, he, he's slinging pest yeah, control too. But Chandler Bergen, let's be honest, <laughs> to be fair, Chandler Bergen is nearly seven feet tall. Yeah, he's big. How he's could you say no to him if he knocked on your door? <laughs> That's what I'm he's saying. He's about the nicest guy. Too. How are you going to say no? <laughs> How are you going to say no to that he's guy? A nice and guy. I don't know if he did it out when he was selling, but in a, in the office every day, he wears this belt buckle that is <laughs> larger than some of our employees. <laughs> that is intimidating in and of itself. His bullfighting belt buckle. <laughs> yeah, Chandler. A bull wouldn't even. He's, yeah, he's too lanky yeah. to be on a bull. A bull wouldn't mess with Chandler. Actually, <laughs> don't mess. That's what we say in the office. Bulls, bulls don't mess with Chandler. <laughs> okay, so you both cut your teeth in the door-to-door realm, um, which probably served you well moving into your current it, company. But it, it did. It, it. Believe it or not, I, I, I don't know what you're going to say, but I'm going to say something here. You say I, it. I was doing. I was doing sales, a mm-hmm. sales degree at Weaver State University. Mm-hmm. In fact, go Wildcats. A, go Wildcats. Had a class with Dame Dollar. Shout out to Damian Lillard. <laughs> you uh, did not. Yeah, he probably he wouldn't remember. It was one class. Are you sure? Maybe yeah. he's on a podcast right now and he's like, and he's talking about me. Probably Eric Grant <laughs> Kerman <laughs> wouldn't remember me. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so I just remember thinking, why am I doing this stupid degree? Everything I'm learning is on the doors. Seriously, it's my education for people and reading people came from on the doors. Mm. And I learned, I learned a massive amount about people and sales doing that. Well, I got tired of doing door to door, right? In the snow, Utah winters. So I, <laughs> I took what I knew about sales from people and I turned it into digital marketing. And so I made this transition from door to sales. I had a company that believed in me, took a risk with me, taught me digital marketing and, uh, they felt like I had a knack for it. And so I went in and I spent their money and I got good at it. And so I took what I knew about how to touch people and motivate people to buy. And I turned it into digital marketing. That's a great, it's a great story and it's a great transition. And I love the, what, what you talked about in the experience being your, your greatest teacher. I think people feel like I can go get an education, you know, and, and it's, 
there's nothing wrong with it. I can go get an education. I'll be able to come out, get a good job. Um, and maybe it's just a little scary to think my best education is outside yeah. of the classroom. I feel like that's been my experience. I went through, I went through college, got a bachelor's, I got a master's, and still I would say that my most valuable lessons have come just through experience. Is that something that resonates with you as well? Yeah, I would say, you know, you talked about lessons. I would say even skills. So I went to, I got a marketing degree. I was at Utah State and Weber State. And I was learning just archaic information. Like they weren't teaching social media yet. <laughs> they were talking about Coca-Cola's, you know, how they won and lost big, you know, and, and big and, uh, big things that they did. But it was so archaic. They weren't teaching anything about social media, digital media marketing, you know, nothing like that. And so they're, you know, they're so, so far behind. So everything I learned was, and I got a, you know, I got a degree, but I learned how to write probably from my degree. That might've been but, the only yeah. thing I got, which is valuable. Super valuable. Yeah. And, and I use it every day. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I, I learned very little from, from my actual education. In the classroom. In the classroom. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's interesting. And there are lots of people like, I mean, you're not going to say, you, you know, you can go be a doctor by just going out and having experiences. Right. No. You, you, know. you, you but, need a, deg a degree for that. Doctor, dentist, whatever, lawyer. nurse, lawyer. Absolutely. But, but this stuff, I'd rather take a person with experience. You know, I don't yeah. care what, you, I, dude, I don't care what your paper says. I, I do care what you, I care what you can do. Yeah. Well, I think there, the other, the other thing that you mentioned is knowing people and relationships and that's invaluable yeah. in the business world yeah. with customers, with employees, with peers. Sure. I think the relationship part of it is super un undervalued. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Let's, let's go back a little bit. I'm assuming that what you're doing now, Muley Freak is, is based on some passion that you had growing up. Yeah, definitely. I, is that, is that, okay, so let's go back to that. Where did you guys, <laughs> where did this whole thing happen? Where did we start? Yeah, we started out in far west Utah on a little dairy farm, maybe 250 acres, uh, 150 milking cows, farmed our own ground. Uh, my, my mother was the firstborn of my grandfather. He's the one that owned the dairy farm. And we lived across the street. And so at a young age, five years old, we got thrown in the milk barn against our will. <laughs> and uh, we, we learned how to work hard and we had to be up at 4 a.m. as little kids to go and milk. And I think we made five bucks an hour mm -hmm. child labor. It was, it was. And no big screen TVs. No big screen TVs. <laughs> no. In, in fact, we, we grew up, Aaron and I kind of grew up a little bit different just because um, he kind of grew up without a mother. And I grew up uh, until I was 13 with a mom. Our mom had cancer. Ah. So while my mom was going through those cancer treatments, we were, we were poor. And when I mean poor, really poor. The Relief Society came over. They provided meals for our family. My dad was trying to provide for not only all these medical bills, but also, you know, five children on $40,000 a year. You know, if it wouldn't have been for my grandparents, my mom's parents, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have made it. But, um, you know, it's, that's the make or break stage where children can go one way or the other, depending mm -hmm. on if they have support. And it was really rough for my dad. I think I was hard on my dad once upon a time, but now that I'm a father, I'm, I'm more understanding. <laughs> it all changes, right? It all changes. And he went through a lot just to just to keep going for us. So we grew up pretty humble, but with that, we grew up uh, hunting, fishing, and um, around animals and dairy animals, horses. We grew up hunting horseback. We did fair animals. I did steers and pigs. Aaron did pigs. I actually did a lamb one year too. So we grew up kind of doing, we didn't do rodeo per se or posse, but we did 4-H. And uh, even from when we were a little kid, I can remember, I couldn't even walk or in hardly step in the mud because I wasn't strong enough, but going on the pheasant hunts out in the back because we can hunt out of our backyard, which is an amazing thing now that I'm looking back and 37 years, 38 years old, but also, um, waiting for them at the door when they'd come home from their deer hunts, like hoping that they'd get a deer like that. That was, that was my life. And Aaron and I both love sports and we're heavily involved in sports, but my first love was hunting and mm -hmm. animals. Um, yeah. I absolutely love animals and love them. And, and because I love them so much, I love to hunt them. You know, I'm going to ask you a question, a follow-up question. Don't let me forget, because that's an interesting statement that you made. But I wanted to talk to Aaron about your experience growing up in that as well and, and doing the same things, hunting, fishing. Was that, did that turn into kind of your escape? 
I mean, you, you said you grow up poor. That's maybe you didn't know it, but that's it's hard. You were kind of living under difficult circumstances. Did you get to escape through these other activities that you were doing? Yeah, hundred percent. And it wasn't just hunting, but our grandpa would take the horses every summer, probably three, four times. He'd throw us on the saddles and he'd take us through the mountains. And we'd go find the uh, the calves that the elk would just have, right? So the the baby calves, and he'd he'd ride us up three four times a year, and that was our escape, right? And then you know rolling into fall, we got to go hunt. Um, Eric was lucky because he got my grandpa when my grandpa was a lot younger and spryer. I still <laughs> I still got an awesome grandpa, and he still did a lot with me. But Eric got the young crazy tough grandpa. Um, when I say still, crazy tough, he was 60, 65 to seventy two, and he was still tough. Yeah. Still tough. Riding a horse. Old so. grandpa tough. Mm-hmm. And oh, he, man. um, he Those was the probably, best. he was probably one of the first guys that, you know, you'd heard of that was going and hunting like multiple States. Like he was, mm. you know, he didn't just hunt in the fall, you know, a week out of the year. Cause it was tradition and fun. Like, no, my grandpa loved to hunt. He'd go to Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, and he hunted like crazy. And so again, instilled that into, to Eric and I, and, and, you know, his sons, my uncle's, as well. And my grandpa was an entrepreneur too. He, he wasn't a poor dairy farmer. He was buying up land. Grandpa, why'd you buy, why'd you buy this piece of land? And he'd sell it the next year. And he did really well for himself. He was, he had that entrepreneur mindset. Mm -hmm. And so those are, yeah, those are a few things that our grandpa really instilled into us. And, you know, our dad, he had, he had a hard, um, a really hard time with my mom passing away. But one of the things he absolutely loved was pheasant hunting. So he's a little different. My grandpa, my grandpa loved big game hunting. My my dad absolutely loved pheasant hunting. And that was my dad's escape. So Eric didn't get as much of this because Eric was out of the house. But he would go pheasant hunting literally every week for mm. three or four months. And he dragged me along. So I grew up, <laughs> it was an escape. We'd go out every Friday, Saturday, and we were gone for the, the full weekend pheasant hunting. So definitely... Nice. An escape for for us. Well, you th- that's a great it's a great backstory, and it's leading down this path. I really love it. You mentioned that you love animals. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on both of you. You love animals. You respect animals. You grew up with animals, and then you said, and that's why I love to hunt animals. Some people might say, "How can you make that statement? How can you love yeah. animals and then hunt animals?" Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting statement, but here's what those people can't say is that all the money I spend on hunting uh, goes towards preserving and conserving those animals. So, for example, the money that I spend in tags and licensing goes for law enforcement to protect those animals. It goes to habitat restoration for those animals, right? What are you spending your money on that helps these animals? Nothing. I don't know. Does Bucked Up? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do they, I, I'm hoping Bucked Up has a charitable organization. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But but you see my point. Like the the, the hunting dollars that I'm spending is going yes. towards uh, helping these animals. And Aaron and I are always doing service projects to help out these animals. And, um, you know, and, and no one's sadder than him and I or we, we see one wrecked on the freeway. Mm. Or we see these homes being built on these beautiful side hills in their wintering grounds, taking away their, you know, all their, all their winter feed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, these these people that don't hunt them, they don't understand what they're doing to to the habitat. And you, this hunting is a lifestyle for you, but this is also a way that you put food on the table. Yes, and- we don't. We don't. I can't remember the last time we bought red meat. We don't buy it. We don't buy meat ever. Occasionally chicken, mm-hmm. or and we don't even buy our salmon because I'll just call it my buddy in Homer, Alaska, and he sends me salmon and halibut. <laughs> So, so <laughs> I every, need to get in touch with your buddy. I know, right? Jeez. So, so everything, the spaghetti, the lasagna, anything we, anything we cook, hamburger, it's everything we eat, everything we kill and harvest ourselves. So, which begs the question, do you have a favorite? Is there a favorite meat that you like to hunt? Uh, there's a favorite animal I like to hunt, but there's a favorite meat I like to eat. My favorite animal to hunt is obviously mule deer, muley freak. And then, <laughs> and then my, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. But my favorite thing to eat is probably uh pronghorn. Wait a second. Everyone says gross. I know. Everyone says it's gross. It's unreal. It's not. It's really good. I, I, uh, it's I have a they little, don't take care of it. Take care of it in the preparation. Mm-hmm. Really? You can't let, you can't let that hide touch the meat. It is so potent and strong. Really? And it, and it traps heat. Uh-huh. So you got to hurry and remove the hide from the oh. animal, from the meat. Oh. And then how do you prepare it? Oh, just whatever. Anyway. There's no special way to prepare it. 
Yeah. No. It's After, just it's just that. It's just take care of it when you kill it. Gotcha. There are tricks to make it like tender and to cook it well. There are some tricks, but you know, like wild game, it doesn't have all this fat. Like you know, you cut up a, a beef cow and it's just marbled and it's got so much fat, right? Because yeah. they finish them off at feedlots and they feed right. them Oreos and whatever they can find, yeah. right? You don't, don't want to know don't what they feed them at feedlots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been to feedlots, multiple feedlots. It's disgusting. And that's how they finish a cow off. That's why you get that big marbling. But with, you know, wild game, it's super lean. So when you cook it, you got to make sure it's moist. You know, it's easy to overcook. Mm -hmm. So you just got to take care of it. Cook it. You know, you learn little tricks on how to cook it to make sure it's done right. But This may sound like a crazy question, but is it is it safe to say that the meat that you harvest is more healthy or better for you to consume than the meat you're purchasing? Oh, 10 times. 100%. Yeah, more protein, less fat. You can go um, look. I mean, we have a chart on our website that shows it, like the protein to fat ratio. Mm -hmm. And wild game is, I mean, it's so much higher in protein, so much less in fat. It's it's ridiculous. So, and that's, you know, aside from what else they, you know, antibiotics or All the other stuff. Whatever yeah, else That's they supposed to be. Yeah. Right. Well, that's fascinating. So you grow up with this love of hunting, love of animals. You have this interesting sales background. You transitioned it into kind of the digital marketing. Mm -hmm. And tell me now, how did that trans... You were able to take your passion and turn it into your business, which I think is the perfect thing to do. I tell my kids all the time, like, just what find what you're passionate about mm -hmm. and do that. Yeah. Go, go figure out a way to do that. Yeah. And you guys have done it. Yeah. And, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I always said my dream job was either to be a professional hunter or something in the hunting industry or be in professional sports. If I couldn't be a pro ball player, which, I mean, every young kid who likes ball dreams of being a pro ball player, right? Um, I want to be in a pro organization. And honestly, I, I like hunting better. I, I, I like hunting better than ball. And, and maybe, maybe not in high school. Maybe I didn't realize that. It was kind of like, couldn't choose because they both meant so much to me, but I didn't, I didn't have as much time to hunt because of how involved both, really both of us were in athletics. So, um, I, I decided, you know, I wanted to take my passion, like you said, and turn it into my business. And so I was like, I saw an opportunity with this Facebook thing and I saw that they'd, and this was in 2012, you know, and, uh, I'm like, man, there's gotta be something here. And they came out with company pages, right? So I just like, well, I'm going to create a company page. I didn't know what I was going to call it or what I was going to do. I'm like, I'll do something hunting. And so I'm like, what am I going to call it? And I'm just like, well, Mueller is my favorite thing. So Muley's the slang term we've always used for him. So I said, Muley Freak. And I started a page, didn't have a logo. And then I was like, well, well, I'll do a logo. And I was like, oh, wait a second. I'll do a giveaway. So I went to Smith and Edwards, bought a shotgun, and uh, <laughs> did this giveaway. Blew up to 60,000 followers in, in two days. So I was like, what the wow. heck? I have something here. And, <laughs> wow. Aaron, and during this time, Aaron was on his mission. So I was just kind of like doing this on the side uh, while I was doing my other digital marketing stuff, and I was really annoying my wife because I was like, man, these look at these followers coming in. These are real people, and they're commenting and sharing and all these things. I'm like, man, I'm like, what am I going to sell them? And so then I came up with this idea that said, show off your rack with a deer logo oh, for mm -hmm. women. Classy. Yeah, very classy. Love it. <laughs> and I posted it up on a, on a Sunday and sold like $2,500 in T-shirts. So I'm like, oh, man. Then then these ladies started sending in the pictures of them wearing I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't uh -oh. do this. <laughs> Because <laughs> one of my young men in one of my wars said something about it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to transition here. And so basically I just started developing other merch and yeah. Gotcha. And just, just kind of snowballed from there. And then I developed partners. Uh-huh. You know, hey, let's do a giveaway together. You know, someone like Hornady, for example. And that's how I got to like, and I remember thinking as a kid, well, I wasn't a kid, I guess I was 26, 27, but I'm like, I can't believe these uh, outdoor companies talk to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I dreamed of being in the hunting industry, yeah. right? If I if I couldn't, you know, be uh, uh, work alongside Larry H. Miller, I was like, I'm gonna I want to work alongside someone in these big companies and yeah. hunting. You know. You mean Larry H. Miller in terms of playing on his basketball team? Or either that, or <laughs> like working <laughs> yeah. in his organization or something. Gotcha. You know? Just I thought that'd be cool to rub shoulders with pro ball players. Now, yeah, why uh, not? I'd much rather be a pro hunter than a pro ball player. I think a lot of pro ball players now want to rub shoulders with you. It, it's it's interesting. We've had a lot of pro ball I'll players bet. reach out to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're like, we're big fans. We're like, wait, what? You're fans of us? <laughs> <laughs> we became friends with some uh, baseball pitchers last year. Cody Bradford plays for the Rangers and uh -huh. pitched in the 
World Series is and pretty also cool. Frampton for the Astros. Yeah. So when you say you became friends, is he? Are those guys fans of the brand, or do you do something with those guys? What? How we does haven't that work? really done anything with them. We got small young families, so we don't have a lot of time for that uh, collaboration type stuff. Maybe in the future, but you know, they just wrote us or autograph balls and said we're big fans. Or, oh, that's awesome! It's pretty yeah, cool. That's, cool. Yeah. that's amazing. So what? What lineup of products are we looking at with Muley Freak? Appar- apparel. Uh, yeah, just your regular gear. shirts, hats, merch, stickers, that simple type stuff, but also like the merino wool long sleeve piece that has a zip down here for a heat dump, a hood, kind of protect you from the sun, thumb holes, so the bow hunters or early season hunters, even in the late season, can have a performance piece. And then we have a puffy jacket that we developed that we thought we wanted something lighter, more packable. If you watch our YouTube channel, we do a lot of backpack hunts. You got to mm-hmm. have light gear for that. Yeah. And then like the bino harness, which is arguably like one of the most important pieces of gear in terms of your success rate for bow hunting, having everything right here, your binos, your rangefinder, your winnicator, everything dialed right here on your chest and be able to be quiet so you don't spook game, mm-hmm. be it deer, elk, or antelope. And uh, that that's really our flagship product. We feel like we really, uh, Aaron and I worked really hard on it for two years. We feel like that's really, we make the best one in the world right now. Yeah. It's very popular. Yeah. So you guys, and, and when did you started the business? Mm-hmm. You were on your mission. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. When did you come back and jump in? So October 2013, I got home from my mission. And then I sold, I started with the pest control company that next spring, worked all summer, kind of did some stuff with them in the fall. And then Eric's like, come, come work with me. Come do it with me. And uh, so that November, November 2014, I started helping them, and yeah, we just kept going from there. That's awesome. So ten years you've been yeah. in, yep. yeah, almost ten years. And yeah. we we started out um, we started out doing uh, digital marketing for other companies. So we were acting as a marketing agency, mm-hmm. and we helped we helped a lot of companies grow throughout those years. And we're like, yeah, gosh, Muley Freak like is taking a back burner for everything. Yeah, because we started we we're helping other companies. He's right. Yeah. We're like, hey, for we, a long time. Yeah, yeah. And we were it was our job to consult these companies and coach them how to do their marketing. And some listened, some didn't. It's consulting, right? We're we're giving our opinions. Sure. But we just developed a mindset like, hey, we can lead a horse to water, but we can't make you we can't make you drink, but we can drink it. <laughs> you, you, know, you know what I mean? So we're like, why don't we just do this for ourselves? Yeah. And so I'd say really full time, full time, Muley Freak, year and a half, two, two and a yeah. half years, maybe. maybe. Last two years. We Is really right? took the YouTube channel yeah. serious for three, the last three years, and we're up to 250,000 subscribers wow. on YouTube. Yeah. So let me ask you this when you decided a year and a half or two years ago to dedicate your resources to Muley Freak, is that is there measurable growth from that point? Oh, no. considerably. Like the, the moment the moment we stopped consulting for others and worked full time on Muley Freak, it was immediate. But it took you a long time to, yeah. to get to that time. point because we had the consistent retainer money coming in, right? And it's hard to pass that. That's up. hard. It's hard to pass up. But like, um, yeah, we 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 just knew that the ceiling for our own our own gig was way higher than these others, and we understood the value of certain things we were doing, Mm -hmm. and we were, we were trying to help these companies understand, hey, if you plant these seeds here, you'll, you'll reap the growth, you know, in six months to a year here, and we've done that here, because we knew if we planted these seeds, they would eventually produce fruit, and that's what's happening now. These seeds that we planted six to 18 months ago are now producing fruit, and so, you know, it's working out. So, one of the things I like to do in this podcast is identify the teaching moments where, where a lesson was learned or something that you could offer the listener. So in that, what you're talking about, planting the seeds, maybe taking the risk, what is, what is the lesson? What did you guys take from that? What is something that a listener might take away from that in terms of, you know what, we've been doing this for nine, 10 years and now we're going to, we've either positioned ourselves or we're just going to take the risk to, to make that leap and do it full time. Where, where is the lesson for everybody here? The lesson for me is the patience. Um, you've got to do things that may not produce immediate um, ROI mm-hmm. or gains, but you've got to be patient with the process, knowing and being confident that you're doing the right things that eventually produce fruit. L- laying the foundation. Laying the foundation. And then, you know, the motivation leaves. Like when you first start a business, you're super motivated, right? way motivated <laughs> right motivation <laughs> m- motivation carries you right but like the motivation leaves i'm i'm if i'm being honest like i'm i'm not motivated that much anymore 
it's it's just a matter of executing, knowing that I have to do these things to produce fruit. Now I have good days where I'm super motivated, things are happening, but there's also as a young entrepreneur, there's there's low days, things you're not getting responses for, or you're not you you know you're having problem getting product, you know, uh, supply chain issues. Yeah, it's easy to get down and depressed and want to quit, but it's it's what you do in those days that dictate the success of your business. Well, and those are I think there's another lesson there, and and maybe that goes back to your you know, back to your, the way that you grew up under very difficult circumstances, yeah. there were days that you just have to push yeah. through. You just yeah. had to figure out how to push through right. on your mission, selling door to door. I mean, I, I would say that all of those experiences help get you guys through some of those difficult days. Yeah, definitely. And it's like back to the farm, there were, there were, uh, weeks, months, years that milk prices were low that I was too young to understand the difficulty of the business, but uh, grandpa saying, man, milk prices are low. They're killing us. And then my grandma saying, milk prices are low. We don't know what we're going to do. It, you, you know, and as a young kid, that's hard to hear because you're like, well, I still have groceries. I still got this. I still got a house to live in. You don't you don't think of maybe, you don't look at that stuff in the lens of an adult, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. You just don't recognize it. Yeah. Like you said, until you're a dad and yeah. <laughs> perspectives yeah. change. So, so now you, you jump in, you're doing, you, you know, you're in your passion, you're doing it full time, doing it every day. And then this weird. Then comes the jealousy and the funny. haters. <laughs> yes. This weird, I'll, crazy I'll, I'll help you. incident occurs. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And the jealousy and the haters. And, and isn't that interesting uh, that. In fact, I think I heard you say it on another another podcast. You know, people are rarely concerned about the average people; mm-hmm. they're always concerned about the exceptional. Yeah, and and so you they guys, don't hate the good ones; they hate the great ones. Yeah, that's exactly what you said. And and so you found yourselves in a in a battle. Yeah, in a battle. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, let's talk about it, man. It was probably one of the hardest times in my life, um, but also one of the biggest times for growth. And I, man, to be honest, I'd have to call Aaron every night. I was in such a bad spot. Like once the kids would get down, my mentally I was just not okay. And I wasn't okay for a long time. And essentially what happened is I, I drew a um, I drew a rifle tag in Idaho and we, we didn't know much about it other than uh, I was going to go and scout a little bit and knock doors and get permission. Ultimately se- secured permission on a piece of ground that was pretty coveted that um, a lot of people knew about that he doesn't give permission to. Mm-hmm. And being the door-to-door salesman that I am, I knocked on this stranger's door and got permission and uh, ultimately killed a deer and a nice deer that this landowner's boss was also pursuing with his wife and kid. And uh, one of the landowner, it turns out, he was trying to um, keep me hidden from this guy, uh, the boss, because he didn't want the boss to know that he'd give me permission to hunt. So after I'd killed this deer, totally reneged. The, the owner did, the landowner did. The landowner, yep. It's weird. It's a weird deal because the landowner has a boss. Mm-hmm. The boss doesn't in, own the in, land. In another business. Yes, yeah. but he owns the cattle business. It's actually a bison business. Gotcha. And um, anyway, yeah, that, that was a mess and a half. Yeah, it and, sounds like yeah. It. Ended up they very, loaded the, very strange circumstance. Very strange circumstance. They ended up loading the deer in my truck, sending me home, which signifies I had permission, um, and ultimately changed their mind three days later in some scheme to come up to try to put me under. And one one of the things the landowner said to me is he said, "I'm going to put you out of business," which is so crazy. I've read all of went the, from my best friend to I'm going to put you out of business. Yeah, I, I've read all of the evidence. I've looked through it all. I've lo- watched the videos and. The circumstances are ridiculous. And you only get to that point, which I think is really awful, if one person doesn't stand up and say, all, all, this is what happened. All that landowner had to do was say, I gave Eric permission. Mm-hmm. Which it's over. Clearly, there's, there's not a case. Which clearly occurred. It sounded to me like the landowner gave you permission, which did occur. And then without you knowing or without the boss knowing, yep. he gave the boss like exclusive. That's it. Bingo, permission. ding, ding, ding. That's exactly what happened. Yep. Well, yeah, I think with their relationship that they had, right, as boss and employee, mm-hmm. he just always assumed, the boss always assumed he was the only one that, you know, gotcha. got a hundred, whether, whether he was told that or he just assumed that or how that's always been, you know, and the boss, the boss even told Eric like, yeah, he doesn't. 
He doesn't give anyone permission. Place. This is his place, so he can do what he wants. But yeah, it was. It's a weird dynamic with the landowner being an employee of the guy hunting, and yeah, it was strange. Well, and everything was fine and dandy until you know th- two, three days later, the boss's brother, who's wow, a hater, called up the boss and ultimately talked him into it. The boss didn't oh. want to do it. In fact, if the boss, or excuse me, the landowner didn't want to move through with this, mm-hmm. and if it wouldn't have been for his bosses influencing him to do it. He wouldn't have done it. He And he told my attorney the whole time, like, man, I just want this to be over. Can we just make this be done? The DA was gunning for a political position, too, of so course. he wouldn't drop it. We've seen this happen before. Oh, my. I'm like, and and then I found those files that my daughter took. Yeah. Thank the Lord. Amazing. Photos, videos of him giving me permission. They still wouldn't drop it. Why? DA needs a job, uh, a, a new job. Fish cop, he needs a new job. He needs to be promoted. It's and like, what are you guys doing? At that point, it's out of the landowner's hand. He signed off he's, on it. He's he wishing gave it's it done. to the he's DA. He's wishing he never did it. Yeah. And now, now it's out of his hands. Now we got a DA and a fish cop who are gunning for a position. And yeah. by the way, we have uh, conservation officers, aka fish cops, who are fantastic fish cops. Absolutely. Uh, individuals, and they're our friends. They do a great job. But no one hates a bad cop more than a good cop. And there's good and bad everywhere. Every sure. vertical, every business, every religion, there's good and bad. Okay? And, yeah, no and doubt. in the meantime, so this this occurred, you know, we had a, a couple big, well, one big company write an article with, you know, a big headline. With yeah. Eric, felony Eric, poaching. Eric's yeah. Name, felony felony poaching. poaching. And it's in a, it's a big art, it's a big company, right? Big magazine. So they put that out there. Um, and then, you know, we got the bosses on social media just ripping i mean they they have they have gathered their armies of of haters mm. and they're just spreading whatever they can on like every adult. facebook group on yeah. every instagram page and they're just pushing it as hard and as hard and as hard yeah. as they can 17 18 20 year old kids trying to bully me it's crazy the cra- it's, it's it's amazing the voice these folks thinks they think they have to try to bully someone into well it's part of the it's part of the terrible thing about social media yeah, because there's lots of social media tough guys. Oh, yeah. you know what I mean? A- everyone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone, <laughs> everyone. So I have a couple questions. I want to follow up on this. One is you mentioned most difficult time in your life mm-hmm. and you also experienced the most am- am- amazing growth, amazing growth, not only, uh, spiritually and, and emotionally, but also our business grew three times. Isn't that nice? It was nice. Yeah. So talk about that. Tell me about... Well, like, you know what they say, there's no bad publicity. I, I, mean, I know they do say that, but in the moment... Oh, it was, that, it was terrifying. Oh, it, was, it was like, it I was can't terrible. believe we're being raked over the coals like this. They're like, Eric, don't say anything. Don't say anything. It'll criminate you and criminate you. And I'm like, I got all these photos and videos. I'm not going to take an internet beating like this. And that's when I started coming out these photos and videos piece by piece. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was there the day before the hunt confirming that I still had permission to hunt. Yeah. And the landlord admitted that. But then he admitted to me in a phone call that he said, well, I didn't know it was rifle season. Even though he was there, he admitted in court to looking at my rifle. Yeah. He's just a big fat yeah. liar. Like, I'm, I'm just being honest. Just a big fat liar. And he was, he was too chicken to stand up to the boss and be like, you know what? I gave Eric permission to hunt. Well, and that's another thing. That's, that's the other stuff that's at play here is that you have an employee who's trying to answer to his boss. His boss wants something to do, and the employee doesn't want to lose his job. Oh, I mean, if, if you're getting a $15,000 retainer in the middle of BFE, nowhere, and all you had to do is keep that boss happy, you might lie too. <laughs> you might. Although I was talking with a good friend of ours, uh, Rich Eggett at mm-hmm. Rockwell Time. You know, you know Rich. And we had this discussion about integrity and honor, and Rich said, "There's no pr- you can't put a price on it. Right. You can't put a price on your integrity and your honor. And so, I mean, that that probably is another lesson underneath this whole story is how that plays in the in the business world. Yeah. Like you 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 both acted in a way that uh was lawful. You took all the right steps, you did all the right things, and still found yourself up against an individual or a party who yeah. decided they weren't going to act yeah. Yeah. with integrity. And, and you know what that helped me realize? I'm like, man, how many people out there are truly, truly innocent that are being 
not only charged, but maybe even convicted of something. No. It, it really brought tears to my eyes knowing that, and I don't know what the percentage is, and I'm not saying everyone that's been accused of murder hasn't actually murdered. I'm just saying there's got to be some that are completely innocent. Yeah, there's, and, that's true. There's and, truth. and it's horrible. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Yeah, and so it really, it really created empathy for me, and 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 brought me back to the Savior, like, um, on on just you know, it is on my relationship with Him and yeah. and my family. It made me realize, man, this hunting thing's really not that important in the grand scheme of things. Yes, it's important because it's my business, my life. But like that's really not what's important. Like it, it, it brought me to Earth. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's amazing. Aaron, Eric said that he was calling you daily, nightly, just struggling with his mental health and you had to be the rock. Like you had to be the foundation. What was that experience like for you? You're the younger brother. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just guessing maybe you looked up to Eric and he did some great things. And, but now he's like, Hey, I need some help. <laughs> Dude, I'm You're my struggling. guy. Yeah, it was, um, you know, obviously it was a lot harder for Eric than it was me. It was tough for me, but I definitely felt like I, was given strength like to you know because I was like man I'm usually kind of you know nervous and I'm a Debbie down I'm I'm different than Eric we have different personalities you could probably tell just from meeting us but um I I felt like it during that time I was like man I felt pretty strong like I and, and maybe I was given that just so I could help Eric through it but I just want to say like through that time we had a lot of great people reach out to us and I think that's where it was like you know the most negative people are the loudest and the people that have a good sense and they're not just sheep that just hear something and believe it, mm -hmm. like that have a good sense, they're the ones that don't really talk, right? They're not loud, but they would reach out to us personally. And so it was like so many people reaching out and saying, hey, you know, this doesn't add up. I know this isn't right. And they were there for us. And so it was um, it was really cool that there were so many awesome people reaching out to us, making sure we were okay. You know, that strengthened me. I had a lot of people saying, Aaron, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, and I was able to, in turn, you know, help yeah. Eric and keep him afloat. And and people supported us more than ever, and that's yeah. where the growth came. They, like, investigated what we were saying, the situation, and they bought more products as a result and supported us more. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. In terms of the social media fallout, which mm -hmm. is so interesting, and you had these publications putting up crazy articles, maybe without even knowing that, the, the whole story. Yeah. Is there like, let, let's thinking of our listener and business owners who are out there dealing with stuff like this currently, the way that you managed it, would you do anything differently? What were the lessons you learned about social media and interacting with the public to overcome some of the obstacles that you were facing? Um, I don't know that I would have managed it any different. I think we did a pretty good job managing it. Uh, we got it maybe we could have got a little bit further ahead of it, but like, why? Like there was no point. We didn't know what was going to happen, but, um, and we're I, following legal counsel. Yeah. And we're following so legal counsel, which is a whole nother story, but, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know that we had changed anything. Just not have been so scared. Just not have been so like mm. so much anxiety. Not, yeah. Not, it. not a worried not so much. Allow it to affect like, us. Like God told me it was going to be okay. I just wish I could have held on to that feeling and trust so it could have carried me through those days, nights, weeks, months that I sat and worried because I had moments of, hey, God, God pat me on the back like, dude, you're good. So I, I wish I could have carried that so that I didn't cause so much pain and grief for my wife and kids. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's an, uh, there's an, there's a philosophy. Stoicism is the philosophy and there's an interesting Seneca is one of the yep. Stoic philosophers and says, and I don't know, oh, I can never get the quote right, but essentially it says, it's not the event, it's your judgment yeah. of the event yeah. that yeah. is 100%, distressing. 100%. In fact, <laughs> I battled, I was so depressed, I battled every single day to get to the gym and go to work because I didn't know, I didn't know. The unknown was killing me. Mm -hmm. And I um, I, uh, I read The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Ryan, Ryan Halliday, yeah. Four times. Book. Four times. Four times. I've only gotten through it once, but yeah. it's an amazing book. Yeah. Yeah. So Four you're times. very familiar. Very familiar with the book. Yeah. I, I still tune into the Daily Stoic and listen to the yeah. tidbits. It's really good. It is it's really, really helpful. I wish I could remember it all. I, I know. I have to go and listen to it again. There's so many, so many great lessons. I think very applicable for today for people who are struggling with 
especially like kids, teenagers yeah, hard. struggling with social media and all this stuff. It seems like they don't have an outlet or a philosophy to follow. And that's a great place to, to go and find, you know, kind of guidance, I guess, yeah. a different path. And, and you know what? The wind always blows the hardest on the strongest trees. And if you're fortunate enough to be a strongest tree, then there's a great opportunity to get stronger. Absolutely. And you were going to yeah, say? Yeah, one thing I was going to say is like we've, you know, since 2016, we've been taking disabled uh, hunters out hunting, uh, veterans. And so like, for me on the hardest days, I'm like, man, we got to keep, we got to keep working hard so we can keep doing good things. Like we're already doing good things. Mm. Like we got to keep going so we can keep doing good things. It's like, if if, for me, at least it's like, ah, man, what if we just quit or give up? We won't be able to keep doing all these, you know, good things. You know, we do a couple donation rifles every year and we raise money for, veterans and and disabled hunters and it's it's so rewarding and awesome and so the fact that we were already doing that before and then something like this hits you know it's like that was a huge help and and boost for us it, for me um you know to get through this and and motivation to you know continue to move forward and yeah the things. servant mindset servant yeah. servant leadership you know doing for others is motivating to keep doing you know so you guys are great examples of that okay this is my favorite part of the podcast. Did I tell you we were doing this? Mm. This is three random questions. No. You don't want to do it? Or no, I didn't tell no, you? No, you didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, three random questions. If we were to arm wrestle, meaning if you, Eric, were to arm wrestle Aaron, who would win? He'd beat me right hand. I'd beat him left hand. Is that true? I don't think he'd beat me either hand, but hundred percent, hundred beat him left-handed. Easy. He's there's no question. I got massive arms. Are you? <laughs> is that genetic, or are you just do you work probably hard? Genetic, probably. By the way, I noticed you that you. Hard. He's much bigger. I'm getting a little say. parched, and I noticed that you were drinking. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip too. That's go. good stuff. By the way, I don't know if you've had the bucked up energy. Uh, you know what I love about it? Blood rounds. Zero sugar. This is the Miami, Miami flavor, not Miami Vice, just Miami. <laughs> and it's good. You don't you don't do the vices until later this afternoon. Yeah, that's that's later this afternoon. <laughs> no question. Okay, that was one random question. You guys can both answer these questions. By the All way. right. Did Taylor Swift put Travis Kelsey on the map? He was already pretty good. He was on the map. He was on the Did map. Did she elevate him? Yes. I hate to admit it. I hate to admit this. Is it a scheme for freaking Biden to get reelected? <laughs> hey, maybe he likes that's, Biden. That's awesome. I don't know. <laughs> get, that could be. I mean, don't put it He's, past. You like, heard what Aaron Rodgers called him. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers called Travis? Yeah. No. Mr. Pfizer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. Here's what I think they I here's what I think they should do for next. The NFL is is you guys are marketers. If the NFL had any sort of marketing sense, what they would do for Travis Kelsey next year is remove Kelsey on his 87 jersey and put Swift. <laughs> that yeah. would be the greatest. In fact, unfortunately, that would probably be the most sold jersey of all time, the Travis Kelsey. Yeah. <laughs> it probably NFL would. Sure. rode he her, her. her coat. Yeah. Like, oh, hard. man. Oh. It, the it, NFL rode yeah. her coats hard. Yeah. He I should hate, change his last name if he marries her. That's what I'm saying. I hate that to admit it, but the truth is, I remember, you guys remember, when Travis Kelsey just used to be a cool football player. Yeah. And now well, he's stay not. Stay out of the he's political a, stuff, Travis. Like, come on, dude. Come on. Don't try to influence guys to get vaccines. Like, this is stupid. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Football. I, I, I kind of align with that. Like, I don't need a celebrity... I, I can read. I do my research. It's less about health and more about money. Yeah. So, and then and then also, I will say this. He had some gummies, some pre-workout gummies. This is before Travis Kelsey was big. I was uh, DMing with his guys about their gummies. By the way, that's my claim to fame. Did you know CBD that? CBD gummies? No, not CBD. They're pre-workout gummies. And by the way, they weren't that great. If you want a great pre-workout <laughs> product, there you go. It's right here in our hands. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was uh, that was question number two. Now you know eHub. Uh, you were we work with we work together. You know that eHub is a shipping company owned shipping by logistics. Wado. Owned by, did you call him Wado? <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
You got it. He's yeah. one. He's the majority for sure. Uh, so let me ask you this question. Would you rather ship your pants or ship your bed? What, what do you mean? Bed for I sure. asked the question. Bed you, for sure. You can. <laughs> bed for sure. Ship you, your why pants? would you rather ship your bed? Because <laughs> I wouldn't want to be walking around with that in my pants. At least I can just roll out of bed and go take a shower. I'd ship my pants. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> yeah. You like to play on words there? Shit your pants? Yeah. I, I knew what you were trying to do there, man. You saw that? Yeah, I saw it took that. you a minute. Pretty, pretty it clever. Took, it took Eric the longest to catch on. But no, I, I had to say it. I had to say it to get it. Yeah, I could see when you when you Shit caught on my pants. Yeah, I could see when you caught on. Now you made me swear. Now you're gonna have to bleep that. We will. We're Ab- gonna get censored now. Abby's, she's a great producer. Thanks, Abadell. She's, she's. Been, Abby has gained four nicknames today. I, I love Abs. It. Yeah, mine Abs. wasn't as mine wasn't as good as Aaron's. His is more original. What about the Abster? Yep, that was good. Abster. Remember, what about, remember Napster? Yeah. The, like, she's the, she's but the, what about Abster? Abster. I really like that one. That's a good one. Yeah. We'll, we'll Do you s- like that one? I like it. You, have yeah, you heard Abster before? Abster, yeah. Oh, oh, dang it. It wasn't original. Hmm. <laughs> okay. okay let me, let's move into this now. I, I, I'd like to talk about kind of your, what your business philosophy is. Maybe it's mixed with your life philosophy. I'd like to talk about what is the best thing that you do as business owners, maybe even as people. Uh, And I'd like to talk about some advice that you might give business owners uh, because of all of the experiences that you've you've had. So let's, why don't we get into that? But first, I want to lead with this. You got into a situation, we were just talking about it. Mm Mm-hmm where you were facing a felony poaching charge. Mm-hmm. Felony poaching charges. If you're convicted of a felony, for a, that means you're n- no more hunting, no more firearms. <laughs> Why do you think I got so depressed? Yeah. And that's been your life. A ve- my life. An, an enormous part of your life. When guns have pulled me out of some of the deepest, darkest times of my life in hunting. Yeah. yeah. So, had that occurred... And thank goodness it, it didn't. But had that occurred, would you have stayed in the business or were you off to do something else? Good question. If I actually would have had my firearm rights revoked, mm-hmm. I'd have had to be on to something else. I'd have become the best bow hunter in the world. That's what I'd have oh, done. Number one. There you go. And number one. and then, So it doesn't cross over. You could still. I mean, I mean, there's places you could hunt, right? Still. Gotcha. But I could hunt out in the world. Like, I still could have done that. You can't. You're like, what are you going to do? Try to make me stop? That's what they wanted to do. They, they want it. Listen, they wanted to end my career. I got the coolest job in the world. So does Aaron. We can hunt for a living. Like, every that's a dream job for everyone. You know, yeah. just like it is, like, if I got to shoot hoops for a living. Yeah. Like, that's a dream job for any hooper. Sure. We had the dream job in the hunting industry. And people want to see us fail. Which is so crazy. I That is the part that I'm having a hard time. Like, what was what was the... What was the benefit for the people trying to bring you down? Like, what did they gain from that? It's a small industry with limited resources. There's only so many animals out there. There's only so many tags. There's only so many places you can go hunting. And so it's like, it's limited resources. So yeah. it's it's cutthroat. Yeah. At least that's, and, that's how I think. It's eliminate just, competition and 80% yeah. of the people are making, you know, 20% of the people are making 80% of the money, mm. you know? Um, it's, it's hard to make, it's hard to make a living like this. Sure. It's, we're not NASCAR, you know, we're, we're hunters. Yeah. We don't have some giant platform. Well, you're getting there. Yeah. Well, we're trying. You're, you're getting there. And being on this show, I mean, don't be surprised. <laughs> but it, <laughs> It's also no different with athletes and, you know, celebrities and whatever. Like everyone's always trying to, you know, take somebody else down, you know, it's just That's true. Human, human nature. It is a little bit. Well, it's a lot human nature. And, you know, I think we would all be better off if, if, you know, philosophically, we didn't act that way towards each other. Right. Relation, you mentioned relationships earlier on in this chat that we're having. Uh, in your, I'm going to ask you both this question in your work life and in your personal lives, how important 
are relationships to you and for your success? They're everything. They're everything. A lot of people talk, ask me, you know, um, I talk to my wife a lot all day long. Um, and obviously she's the most important relationship. And what's cool about this business is I get to work with my family. I mean, if me and Aaron had different professions, how often would we talk or see each other? Not very much, probably, especially with, with our young children. And then it comes to bit the business side. Like I get asked all the time, do you still talk to your friends from high school, college? I'm like, no, mm-hmm. I've talked to my partner, sponsors and client or customers. Mm-hmm. They're, those are the people I talked to. Those people have become my best friends. Um, so relationships are everything. And, and luckily this situation that we're talking about, if I didn't have partners and clients and customers who really knew Eric, they'd cancel this because that's what, that's what they tried. They were coming after you. They were coming after us. They tried to cancel us. Yeah. But luckily I have a good enough relationship with my folks that they know who we are and they know the intentions of my heart and we survived. Yeah. You know, so relationships are everything. In fact, I crazy story, uncle, successful entrepreneur, um, maybe, maybe a tad bit, uh, secretive, maybe a tad bit selfish, but a good dude overall. Uh, he wouldn't share any of his business philosophy, which is kind of strange, but he did say one thing to me, relationships, relationships, relationships. And I didn't know what that was. Me- I didn't know what that meant as a 21 year old, mm-hmm. um, as I was taking him to Tijuana <laughs> for medical attention, for, for medical attention. Yeah. That's another, that's podcast. An- another <laughs> podcast. But anyway, that's what he said to me. And I didn't, I didn't know what it meant, but I know now. Yeah. That's great advice. So a couple of years ago when Eric and I decided to go full time, one of the very first things that we did is we said, we're going to build it customer by customer. And so, you know, we learned that from somebody else and we talked about it. And so we set a goal every day that we're going to talk to individuals every single day, make relationships. And, and that's what we did. And that was for me, I think that was one of the biggest things that we have done over the last two years. And we have people tell us all the time, well, you're different than, than so-and-so, a competitor, because you're ver- so personable. And so that's what we've done. You know, when we go to trade shows, you know, we talk to everyone. We say hi. Every day we're on Instagram or on our phone, you know, talking to loyal customers and talking to new ones, being, you know, awesome, but congratulations. Like we're talking with people, trying to build people up. And I think that's been one of the most important things that we've done together to to grow this business is reaching out individually and, and you know, gaining a customer by customer, yeah. pers- one person at a time, gaining relationships. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. And, and we're big on the law of attraction. You know, absolutely build people up, congratulate them. Yeah. Be happy for them. Yeah. Be happy for their success. There's there's enough success for everybody. There's enough for everyone to go around. Yeah. Well, I loved your, you know, there's lots of things about your story that I like. uh, Clearly there's the, you know, it feels like I always run into these things of there was this, there's this part of your life. There's a struggle. And you have to overcome that struggle. Maybe you guys have had that a few times. And, but overcoming that struggle is critical to building success in the future. I love that. I love that part of your story. Uh, based on those things and all this stuff that we've talked about, is there, is there a philosophy, a business philosophy a person, a role model, something that you follow that you think has contributed mm-hmm. extensively to this success? I think yes, somewhat. Um, you know, one of the things I've I've told Aaron a long time ago when I first started in the social media marketing thing is pick what you want to do and become the very, very, very best at it. Just pick it and then be dominate it. Work on it. Um, sharpen your tools in, the, in that specific area. And then, you know, probably two, three years ago, I ran into a a guy named Andy Frisella. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has almost many of the, he has many of the same philosophies and the things that I've always felt about life and business. And he just has a platform to say it. And I, I don't want to say I've followed it, but I have followed it, but it's kind of, it's kind of who I am, you know? So, yeah. um, he's been a mentor for me. I don't know. Um, I don't know what Aaron's saying in terms of mentorship, but um, yeah, he's like, like he says that, uh, what is it, uh, his line? Personal excellence is the ultimate rebellion and becoming the very, very best you can be at everything. Well, that specific thing you do, but the best human you can be. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you refute that? I don't know. I love it. I love that. I love the philosophy of 
my dad used to say it too. You know, if you're going to do something, then you be the best. Yeah. Do it. Be the best. Be the best. You lay AstroTurf, yeah. be the best dang AstroTurf guy there is. You yeah. detail cars, be the best stinking car detailer there is. You you make t-shirts, be the best dang t-shirt guy there is. You, you guys know Jordan Peterson, Jordan B. Yeah. Peterson? I think he's fantastic. He, I, if I listen to his books, I have to listen three or four times because it's so, it's so <laughs> over high, yeah. my head. But he has a story in one of those books about uh, an interaction he had with a, a kid who worked in a, in a restaurant as a server, kind of low on the totem pole. You know, in the restaurants, it's like the cooks are kings and you don't mess with the cooks. And then you have, you know, the management and the mater d's and then everybody it flows on down and you get down to the to the servers and, you know, maybe they're lower on the totem pole. Yeah. And he was he was just having a terrible time with his job and with his career. And he was young. He didn't like it. He didn't know what he wanted to do. But he, he read something about that, about from Jordan Peterson, listening to his podcast, listening to the YouTube channel. And it said, if you're going to do it, be the best at it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like the same philosophy. It's not your circumstance. It's your judgment of the yeah. circumstance. And so he took it to heart mm -hmm. and almost immediately, almost overnight changed his trajectory because he got engaged yeah. Yeah. in, in what he was doing. Yeah. And so I think it's a very powerful story. Yeah. And just a, just a memory that I just thought of, and I don't know why I thought of this, it's kind of crazy and not to toot my own horn because Aaron's really good at some things. Um, very good at a lot of things actually. Um, but one of the things when I was milking cows, it's like, how do you become like best cow milker? And you know, as my grandpa introduced me to his friends, this freaking little strawberry blonde looking kid. And he, you know, just like my little guy knocks, he's, he's a spitting image of me. I get such a kick out of him when he goes and says hi to Aaron or anyone or I introduce him. But my grandpa used to say, this is my best dang cow milker there is. And I'm like, what does that mean? You know, but he, he gave me positive reinforcement and we had this strainer that collected all the debris that mm -hmm. came off the cow's udders, mm -hmm. AKA tits, nipples. Yeah. All of those things. Yeah. Bef Known by all of those things. Yeah. Before it came in. So some of that's poop, straw. Yeah. On an udder? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? Absolutely. Yeah, they sleep. They sleep they in poop and dirt. Yeah. 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 So anyway, this strainer, nice. <laughs> and he'd say to me, he says, my grandpa would say to me, there is no one who leaves the strainer as clean as you do because I would wipe them, their udders mm -hmm. and nipples so well mm -hmm. that when I stuck the, the milker on, that it, it they would be clean. So when it would hit the strainer, the strainer would be super clean. And I took pride in that. That's Yeah, that's a dumb thing as a young kid. But I wanted to be like, I have the cleanest strainer out of all grandpa's cow milkers. Yeah, but it was your grandpa. Who put it in my head. That's exactly he put right. It in my he head. knew what he was doing. He's the best dang cow milker I have. And he'd chuckle and laugh, you know, as I just like six-year-old kid. Yeah, and you were like, I'm the but, best milker But that's milker what Aaron and I has. try to do to our children. Oh, he's the best dang kid. That sucker, he's... He's so tough, and yeah. you know we say that to our little boys, we and or our girls. She's so sweet and kind and pretty. You know we we try to give them those those positive affirmations because guess what? They'll believe it, sure, and they'll become it. Yeah, you know. And one thing is, one thing my dad would always say too: you whatever you want to become, you can do. I you know. just got to put your mind to it. It's, that's the best thing. That's yeah, the best so gift true. my dad ever gave me. Yeah, and if you can get your kids to believe it, that's the thing: is you have to just. Yeah. Let them know constantly. And, right. And it's the same thing with this business. Aaron and I just kept chipping away, chipping away, chipping mm. away. And now it's happening. And we're just like, told you. The yeah. other day we had a nice PO coming in and we're like, told you. We're, <laughs> we're doing it. You manifested yeah, it. Yeah, we're doing it. See how you yeah. did that? Aaron, what about your life philosophy, role model, personal philosophy, business philosophy? What What are the things that guide you? Why have you been so successful? I think being the youngest kid in my family, I learned that you take things from a lot of different people, what they do really well. And I think my whole life, like, I, I just remember seeing, you know, Eric doing good things and Eric doing bad things. Same thing with my sisters, this sister doing good things and this sister doing bad. Anyway, I, I got used to taking um, the good from what everyone did and, and learning from them or not to do this or to do this. And so I think I, you know, I have a lot of role models in my life, Eric being one of them. Eric, I like, I don't think there's, I said this the other day, I don't think I've ever met anyone that works harder than Eric or than my grandpa. And, and, uh, 
or anyone that's as good as relationships as my grandpa. He was incredible with relationships. And so I take things from a lot of different people and, and I use those in my life. I'm very observant and I watch and, you know, I try to take those things from people and, and use them in my life. Um, but yeah, I, it's the same thing. Uh, my faith is strong in Jesus Christ. And I, th- I think one of the biggest things I try to do every day is just try to follow him and do what he does. And I think a lot of his philosoph- philosophies that he taught um, are what you can use in business. Mm-hmm. And for example, last night I was reading about, you know, he was talking to people and he said, you know, I was in, I was in prison and you visited me. And they said, we didn't visit you in prison. He was talking about, other people. So when you serve, you know, when I serve Eric, I'm serving the Savior. That was his point, right? When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was in prison, you visited me. But um, anyway, so that was just something I took um, last night when I was reading. But I was thinking about that, like when Eric and I were in prison, or when things were really sure. hard. Luckily, I didn't make it to prison. He didn't make it to prison. <laughs> but when we were in a very difficult time, people came to our aid. A lot of different people, a lot of great people. Yeah. And so you know, I try to do that. You know, who, who needs help? Who do I need to reach out to? Um, you know, fo- again, fostering relationships, trying to help people. One of the biggest things I think I learned through, you know, what Eric went through is being slow to judgment, really try to get to know mm. what happened. Cause it's really easy to hop on and comment, right? It's like, you don't even know what's going on. And so I see stuff all the time on Instagram, Fox news, CNN, and I'm like, Hmm. You know, it's easy to just believe something so easily. Social sure. media has made it that way. But it, instead, you know, choose to take the higher road always. And, um, you know, maybe that person is really not as bad as, you know, someone on social media is making them out sure. to be. And, and so being slow to judgment and and just uh, really getting to know somebody and find out what happened, you know, rather than just... critical. Yeah. yeah, just throwing someone under the ground, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree 100%. And your role model is the tops. I mean, you can't get any better than that. Yeah. Absolutely. You were going to say? I was just going to say, look, look at the people that, um, who, who, seriously, who has time to write a 10, 15 minute tweet or comment about something mean about someone else? A lot of people. It's crazy. So Which, many people. That, that's, if you're reading someone you know who what? took the time out of their day to leave a mean, hateful, distasteful comment about someone else, think about them, for example, uh-huh. and how miserable they oh, must be. It must be. Yeah. And what if you took that same 10 or 15 minutes and found something positive about somebody oh, and put yeah. that down? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. what's wrong with you, that? You can't, that's, that stuff's poison. Yeah. You know, I don't think people realize what kind of poison that is. And, you know, they say a natural man's enemy to God. And I think the natural man has a tendency to be jealous. Mm. We all do. You have to fight jealousy and then replace it with the law of attraction, which good. Dang, they, they're, they're doing really well. He got lucky. Or you could say, they're doing really well. He must have worked his freaking butt off. Good for him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You know, Wado, he's doing really good. He, Wado, got lucky. Wado. Hey, you know, <laughs> no, Wade, I bet Wade went Wado through some and really I have hard things. things. He probably went through some hard times right. to get him where he got to. Let me just tell you something about Wado. Wado did go through some hard times. Yeah. Extremely hard times. Right. I've and he that. over. He overcame it. Now he could have quit. He, he he could have quit, and he may have contributed to his hard times through sure. whatever mistakes that he made. But just like you guys, there's a learning experience, and I think I want that message to get through: is that you're going to run up against a brick wall. You're going to feel like you can't get up the next day and go to the gym. You're going to be in a position where you have to support somebody close to you who's on the verge of collapse. Those are all overwhelming things. But to me, you guys just kept getting up and taking that step, getting to the gym, doing the next thing. It's hard. Being a servant to other people. And it's not easy, but that also led you to where you are today and the success that you're having today. So that's an unbelievable story. Incredible story. I want to ask you one last question. I know we're, I told you that this hour was going to fly by. How long have we been on this? this is going to a be little like, over an hour. Oh, okay. I was yeah. going to say, this has been one of your longer podcasts. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> to be fair, I, I couldn't get Rich Eggett to stop talking. Oh. That's, yeah, that's... That's surprising. Yeah, Abster, you'll have to knock this one out. But yeah, that guy talks a lot. 
<laughs> it's the best though. He's so engaging. Yeah, he's and he's funny. so interesting. Yeah. And he's so funny. And by the way, I think you can pick up a Muley Freak watch from Rockwell Time. I yeah. think they produced those, right? Yep. Absolutely. That would, that would be cool. Uh, okay. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one last opportunity to give to our listeners some, like you can either say, what is the best thing that you do in your business? Or what is the best advice you have? in business? Um, or what is, you know, we've talked about the thing that you had to overcome or what is a mistake that you made that you learned from? I'll give you both an opportunity to, to talk through those things. Um, the best thing I've ever learned in business, I'll just do that one is the, the magic and the beauty is in not giving up and not quitting. And it doesn't happen. Um, it, the, the magic doesn't happen until you've been tested. And that, and I believe that's not only applicable to business, but also, you know, your life, your mm -hmm. relationships, your relationship with God, all of it until you've been tested. Well, so the magic is in not giving up and not quitting. And I think that what, what you're, what you're talking about as well is that, you know, we all know, uh, that we're going to be tested. I think people need to understand that you're going to be tested. You're going to have hard times and difficult times. And how do you respond to that? How are you prepared to respond to that? And that's another thing that, that you know, the obstacle is the way they, they talk about that is you have to constantly prepare yourself to manage the test that is inevitably coming your way. Right. So absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Aaron? Mine's similar. Um, there's always, I think, post your hardest times there's going to be the greatest success that comes if you if you can make it through. And there's always light at the end of the tunnel, we always say, right? But at your greatest adversity, that's where the greatest uh, strength is going to be and the greatest growth and the greatest success is going to be right after that. So if you can hang on tough and get through it, the, the greatest growth and success is right there. And it, it's the same thing. Like, why do we go to the gym? We, we go there to break down our muscles, right? When you lift weights, you're breaking down your muscles to build them back up. And that's that's no different with life. When you when that, that adversity breaks you down, but if you get through it and you learn from it, then the greatest success and joy is at the end of that. Yes, no, no question about it. I've said this before on the pod, podcast. It's very applicable here. Uh, founder of Stoicism, Zeno, Zeno the philosopher, said he made a very prosperous voyage when he shipwrecked. Mm -hmm. He didn't want a shipwreck. No. None of us want the shipwreck. But the way that he responded to it and the way he overcame it made for a very prosperous voyage. And I think that applies to you two perfectly. So with that, let me just say congratulations. Muley Freak is amazing. You guys are amazing. Continued success. Eric, Aaron, I'd love to have you come on again at some point and follow up on this, but perfect. I loved it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Know Your Ship podcast presented by eHub. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. 